episode of Questions of the Week, where we take on some of the toughest questions and challenges posed to us by seekers and skeptics about Christianity. So welcome with, uh, welcome here, and uh, this is with Honolulu Christian Church and Evidence and Answers. Now, in this, in last week's edition, we talked about God and the problem of evil, and basically the question was, if God is all perfect and all powerful, how did evil arise in this world? And we talked about uh, God is all powerful and all wise and uh, a loving being and created creatures who can do the greatest good, which is to love and enter into a love relationship with Him. And that requires free will. And in freedom, freedom is not evil, but in freedom there is the potential to do otherwise, which would be evil. <laughs> and Adam and Eve uh, misused their freedom and disobeyed God, and that's how uh, evil and suffering entered into the world, and we've been suffering the consequences ever since. Now, I said Christianity provides the best, most reasonable answer to the problem of evil and suffering, and really the only message of hope. And I said provides the only reasonable answer because it acknowledges that there is a God and acknowledges the reality of evil. Atheism does not acknowledge the existence of God, but atheism's problem is this. How do you define evil? You can't say something is objectively evil unless there's an absolute, universal, unchanging moral standard of good by which you are measuring by. And the question is, where did that absolute standard come from? So atheism runs in a problem in how do you actually define good and evil. <clears throat> Without God, it's basically just opinions. Pantheism runs into a problem as well. Religions based on the pantheistic worldview, like Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, and others. Because either you're going to have to say that this world is an illusion, as in Hinduism, it is the dream of Brahman, all right? Uh, if this world is an illusion, then ultimately evil is an illusion. And really, no one can take a philosophy or religious position that says evil is simply an illusion. Or you're going to have to say, if all is one, all right? If everything in the universe is one, then good and evil then are resident in the very character of God or Brahman or the one. Uh, and so that poses a problem as well. Whereas in Christianity, we acknowledge the existence of God and the reality of evil. And so therefore, the Bible can provide the most reasonable answer to the problem of good and evil. And I said Christianity provides the best message of hope. What message of hope does the atheist or naturalist worldview offer in the midst of a world filled with evil and suffering? Well, that's a real tough one, right? Uh, you're just a product of chance. You're an accident. You're a cosmic accident. The universe exploded into being out of nothing uh, by chance. It's, it's just an accident. There's really no ultimate purpose for the existence of the universe. Uh, the universe, we know, is running out of energy. As it expands, it runs out of energy, and it's going to reach a state of final entropy where it runs out of energy, and all things come to an end. But also, our planet, our solar system will come to an end, and you and I will come to an end. And so really, our life ultimately has no ultimate meaning, significance, or purpose. We're here by accident with no intended purpose. Our suffering then ultimately has no meaning or purpose. We suffer in a meaningless existence, and we become extinct or annihilated forever and ever and ever. So that's really not a great message of hope in the midst of evil or suffering or any kind of uh, meaningful uh, answer to the problem of our existence here. Well, what about pantheism? Well, in pantheism, uh, pantheism teaches the doctrine of reincarnation, that uh, in this life you attain good and bad karma and you're continually reincarnated for millions of years, uh, thousands upon thousands of reincarnations over and over and over again to come back into this world and face this world of suffering, to suffer again and again and again and again and again 
infinite until you reach the state of enlightenment and you become one with the one, with the cosmic energy of the universe, one with Brahman, uh, one with um, the, the force or whatever it may be, that you will no longer exist as an individual person, but you are absorbed into the one. All right, well, that's the message of hope of the pantheistic worldview or the pantheistic religion. Yes, yeah, so I believe Christianity offers the most reasonable answer and really the only message of hope and meaning in the midst of a world in which we encounter evil and suffering that no other religion or worldview can offer. Now, <clears throat> the question that we're addressing today really follows up on the first question and that's this if God is all-powerful and loving why doesn't he destroy evil now why does he allow evil to continue and to persist and the basic argument goes like this all right in one form or another this is really the basic form of the argument it goes like this if premise one if God is all good he would defeat evil he would want to defeat evil Second, if God is all-powerful, he could defeat evil. But premise three, but evil is not defeated. Therefore, we conclude no such God exists. All right, and that's the basic form of the argument here. Well, <clears throat> seems like a very formidable argument. It's a very challenging argument that you hear this argument in one form or another. Whenever I have had discussions with atheists, usually this is the argument that's brought up. Well, the flaw in this argument is really premise three. All right. Premise one is if God is all good. He would want to defeat evil. Premise two, if God is all-powerful, he could defeat evil. Premise three, but evil is not defeated, therefore no such God exists. Premise three is the one that I said is flawed, all right? That uh, evil is not defeated, all right? Really what the objector is saying is this, evil is not defeated, meaning evil is not defeated and will not ever be defeated. And you see, there's really no way for the objector to know this, all right? As the Bible teaches, evil will one day be defeated. Uh, when evil runs its course, right? God allows all things to run their course, even evil. God will allow evil to run its course. When it has fulfilled its purpose, then God will bring it to an end, all right? And all good God promises to do that, and all powerful God can do that, and indeed will do that at his appointed time. And how will God defeat evil? Well, he will separate good from evil forever. We see that in passages like Matthew chapter 25, where he separates uh, the... Uh, Sheep from the goats there, separating the righteous from the unrighteous forever. Quarantining evil uh, forever, separate from his intimate presence there in a place of quarantine called hell. And that's essentially what hell is. It's being separated from God forever and ever. So he will punish evil and reward the righteous or reward good. And he will defeat death and Satan and evil once and for all. We know that is coming because of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It says that in Colossians 2, that there upon the cross he rendered the forces of evil and sin powerless there. So he officially defeated evil on the cross in his first coming. Now, the actual or the ultimate defeat of evil will occur at his second coming, all right? But it has been officially defeated there upon the cross. With his resurrection, he conquered uh, the forces of evil and sin, and now we just await its ultimate culmination, the actual defeat 
of evil uh, when the world is restored and suffering comes to an end at his second coming. And we know that's going to happen because it has been officially defeated at the resurrection. The uh, illustration uh, goes like this, all right? During World War II, all right, the Allies planned the largest land invasion of Europe in the history of the world. It was called D-Day, all right, in which the Allied forces landed tens of thousands of Allied troops on the shores of France there. And uh, we didn't know if D-Day would be successful, but uh, on that day there was a fog that seemed to cover the shores there that hindered really the German army there from seeing uh, the boats uh, way off in the distance and as they came closer they still weren't able to see them and then they launched their massive uh, assault and D-Day was a massive success all right and when D-Day uh, was accomplished we knew we were going to win the war all right we knew that once the Allies had made it on the shores of France we were gonna push the Germans back and we knew that victory was inevitable, right? So between D-Day and V-Day, the troops were called to press forward, right? Now, our D-Day has come, all right? Our D-Day has come on the cross when Christ died for sin and rose again. That was our D-Day, right? The official defeat of evil. And we know that V-Day is soon to come. Right? But between that time, we are called to press on. So God has not yet defeated evil. Right? But one day at his appointed time, he will bring all things to an end. Well, the question is this then. What is God waiting for? What is he waiting for? Why doesn't he judge evil now? Well, great question. Uh, and... and uh, Peter addresses that in his book of 2nd Peter. Peter says that God is patient, not wanting any uh, to be separated from him. He desires for many more to be saved and he's patiently waiting for many more to be saved before he comes to judge evil. 2nd Peter chapter 3 verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And so God is patiently waiting and still allowing people uh, to come to a saving knowledge of his son, Jesus Christ. All right. And so God delaying his judgment is actually an act of love and grace upon us. I mean, think about it. I'm glad God did not judge the world back in 1980 when he very well could have because if he did I would be in hell separated from God forever because I didn't come to know Christ uh, till a few years later but if God had uh, judged the world in 1980 I was a clear atheist and rejecter of any kind of belief in God and in Jesus Christ I'd be separated from him in hell forever and I'm sure many of you uh, if God had judged the world 10, 20 years ago, many of us would have been separated from him forever. And so God is allowing evil to run its course and being the sovereign and all-powerful God he is, even using it to accomplish his purpose. It doesn't thwart God or keep him from accomplishing his will. He uses even evil and our suffering to bring about his purpose and his will. But at an appointed time, it will come to an end. Well, let's take some of your questions here. And remember, if you've got a question, uh, email me at pat at evidenceandanswers.org, pat at evidenceandanswers.org, and we'll field your questions on a future show. Or, you know, type in uh, right here on the uh, YouTube channel that you're watching here. Type in your questions, and we'll try to answer them either on this show or in future shows to come. Now, here's a couple questions we had here. Uh, Pat, you explained the origin of evil. 
and we did last week. If you missed it, go watch uh, the video from last week. We talked about how evil originated in this world. But how does that explain other kinds of suffering, such as natural disaster that kills thousands of people? Right, there's two kinds of evil. Moral evil, which free creatures inflict upon one another through their choices. And there's natural evil, typhoons, tsunamis, tornadoes that may uh, cause tremendous amount of damage uh, and loss of life. Well, we know that in the Bible, sin, the, uh, when Adam and Eve sinned, the ramifications of that not only had a great effect on us as humans, but also on the entire created world as well. And the uh, effects of sin has permeated uh, throughout the natural world. And Romans 8, verses 19 through 22 speaks about that. It states, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and to obtain the freedom of glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth unto now. And so what you see in tsunamis and tornadoes and earthquakes are the residual effects of original sin. Sin has affected uh, mankind, but also all of creation as well. And so the redemption that God brings, we see in the Bible, is not only the redemption of mankind, but of creation itself. So it's the restoration of man and our relationship with God, but also the restoration of all creation, which suffers from the effects of sin there. So we live in a fallen world, in a fallen system, which one day is also part of God's redemption plan. And we see the beautiful new creation that awaits us when evil is once and for all defeated. Next question here. <clears throat> this is a pretty tough one here. If God is all loving and powerful, why does he allow children to come into this world with severe physical defects, live a life of meaningless suffering, and die? You know, I was asked this question uh, at a debate by an atheist. And I first turned it uh, on my atheist friend and I said, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to ask you to offer us what is atheism's message of meaning and hope to these kinds of children that are born with severe um, physical defects all right what is your answer and message of hope uh, and the atheist was kind of quiet there and I said well here's your message all right you're an accident all right we are all accidents of just natural causes and chance Right? And ultimately, our existence is meaningless because there is no ultimate purpose for our existence. Uh, we live a meaningless life and then we are extinct and annihilated. So ultimately, our existence is meaningless. Your existence is meaningless. Uh, you're just a flaw of nature, a flaw of the Darwinian evolutionary process. Uh, your life is ultimately meaningless. Your suffering is ultimately meaningless. And in the end, you'll be annihilated and extinct anyway. All right? I said, that's atheism's answer. What is pantheism's answer? Well, you must have had bad karma in your previous life. You must have been a really bad person. That's why you're born with all these defects and you're going to suffer. And guess what? You get to do it all over again. All right? That's pantheism's answer. And so he kind of looked at me and, and he said, well, then I'm asking you, you know, I asked you, what is your answer? And I said, this is my answer. All right. I said, what do you mean that these children who are born with these physical uh, special needs, what do you mean they live worthless lives? What do you mean by that? You know, in the Bible, we learn more from suffering than from the good times. You know, and James 1 says, Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you go through trials of all kinds, knowing our suffering produces character and character hope. All right? <clears throat> we learn more from our suffering. And I said, 
Who says their life is meaningless? I learn more from those who have overcome such great odds than those who are born, you know, with everything given to them. I am more inspired by people like Johnny Erickson Tata, a quadriplegic, and uh, her powerful testimony. Nick Vujicic, you know, a guy born with uh, no arms, no legs. I enjoy reading biographies. There's a story of a preacher in Japan uh, who has no legs, and his wife has to carry him around on her back. All right, and uh, we all learn a lot from that. I mean, we are tremendously inspired and enriched because of people like them. All right, an inspiring message that they have to give, and those of us who encounter people with special needs right we are transformed and changed forever in very powerful and positive ways which uh, really there's no other life lesson we could have learned in a any greater way than taking care of someone uh, with special needs you know I know a man who adopted three special needs boys and I tell you what he wouldn't trade it for the world and any parent who has tell me the same thing they wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. His two children, man, they are so mature. They have learned not to be selfish, to be giving, to take care of their three brothers with special needs. Uh, they just came out terrific, learning how to sacrifice. The whole family has had to learn how to sacrifice and care for the brothers. Uh, if anything, they have been transformed in powerful and positive ways. I have seen grandchildren, you know, moving back uh, from the mainland, moving back home, giving up great careers to take care of their grandparents who have very special needs at that time in their final days. And I'll tell you what, grandchildren taking care of their grandparents learn powerful lessons right that no book uh, or anything else can teach you know taking care of their grandparents in their final days with their special needs the transformation that occurs uh, we lose that sense of selfishness we learn how to give every day um, I know a couple who you know have two sons with uh, MS, you know, the Rogers family, good friends of mine. Uh, I've interviewed them. Go to evidenceandanswers.org and listen to my interview with them. They have two boys with MS, and the doctor told them, they said, you know, the kids, when you give birth to them, are going to have MS. You may not have them around for more than 12 years. Do you still want to have these boys? And both times they said yes. All right. Now, <clears throat> you know, the boys have passed 12 years old now. But, you know, there were several times, you know, as their organs began seemingly to shut down, you know, the older son needed a heart transplant and they thought they were going to lose him several times and they've had to walk with him through some very uh, difficult months where they thought they were going to lose their son, you know, to go through all and watch, you know, I'm watching them go through this tremendous amount of pain, seeing what their boys are going through you know, at, the, at such a very young age. And when I interviewed Jill and Randy, I said, you know, uh, you had the choice of not bringing these boys into the world, but you brought them in, and there are days you suffer tremendous heartache seeing the suffering they go through, and uh, you as parents probably suffer more than them. You know, and I said, is it worth it? Would you do it all over again? And guess what? Every parent I've talked to, like the Rogers, says, absolutely absolutely we would go through it again uh, because it's all worth it we've experienced the love of God the love of others what it means to sacrifice and to give the incredible ways we've grown as a family grown to love one another grown to love God we could have never learned in any other way so uh, if God exists if the Bible is true then uh, there is meaning in our suffering these Children born this way do not live meaningless lives. And guess what? When this life is over, guess what? They live in glory forever with Jesus Christ. No longer in a position where they have to suffer 
any of their uh, physical defects anymore. They're in a state of eternal perfection. Uh, death, uh, sickness, suffering has been overcome through Jesus Christ. They're there in their resurrected, glorified, perfect bodies for all eternity. I mean, think about it. How long is our suffering here upon this earth for what we have to look for in all of eternity? I mean, you, you know, when we were little kids and mom and dad brought us to the dentist, most of us probably cried, you know, because uh, of the torture that we would undergo for five or ten minutes. And we cried and we, and we thought it was the end of the world. All right. Well, we look back on life now and say, look, I've got 50, 60, 70 years of having, you know, good teeth, good, healthy teeth. Those five, ten minutes in that dentist chair of suffering was nothing, was nothing compared to the lifelong, you know, health that I have because I have good teeth from the dentist. Those five, ten minutes crying in that chair of suffering, that was nothing. You know, it was well, well worth. In fact, I look back now and I think it was pretty silly, you know, crying in there thinking it's the end of the world. Those five, ten minutes I was in the dentist chair. Well... That's a tremendous message of hope that only Christianity offers. That our brief time here upon this earth is filled with trying times uh, where we battle against evil and suffering, but those are just a few moments compared to the weight of eternity uh, that we will spend forever with the Lord. And so that's why I say Christianity offers the only meaningful message of hope, which atheism and pantheism cannot offer here uh, and I remember and I think we'll close today with uh, uh, the final question that atheist asked me he said well how do you know that's not just wishful thinking you know how do you know that's just not pie in the sky kind of thinking and I said I know because of the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ it is a historical event there's powerful uh, compelling evidence that Jesus Christ was a real person who lived a miraculous life who died and rose again that's just not wishful thinking that is a historical event in which is backed up with compelling and powerful evidence and he asked me well how do you know that and I said I said I thought you'd never ask and I got to go in and defend the resurrection of Jesus Christ which we'll talk about at a future show but uh, in Christ, we have a God who came to this earth, suffered along, you know, entered into our fallen world, suffered alongside with us, died and rose again, assuring that uh, what we know about our life here upon the earth, that it's brief and that there is a glorious future that awaits, is not simply wishful thinking but is truth based on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Christianity offers the most reasonable answer and the only meaningful answer to the problem of evil and suffering. Well, thanks for being with us on this episode. We hope you'll be with us every week here. If you miss uh, any one of these shows, uh, you can go to uh, the Honolulu Christian Church YouTube website or my YouTube website there and see past shows. And I also invite you to go to my website there at evidenceandanswers.org, evidenceandanswers.org, and you can listen to interviews from some of the top scholars from all over the world on subject of God and evil, God and uh, faith and science, Buddhism, Islam, and a whole lot more. All right. So if you've got any questions, you know, email me there at pat at evidenceandanswers.org, pat at evidenceandanswers.org, and we'll address your questions here on Question of the Week. Aloha. We'll see you next week.